morning. Art Hostage here and we're going to do another episode. Well, I haven't said that for a while, but I just wanted to bring you a little um, standalone episode um, because there's a remarkable interview, okay, with um, David Hunt. You know, the long fella. Everyone's scared to say his name. Well, there's this and I just wanted it for posterity, right, so that we've got it... Um, because uh, a YouTube video, okay, has um, uh, has dropped, and so we, um, I just want, you know, in case it gets taken down, I just wanted to have a recording of his voice, okay, and it's interesting. So let's have a listen, right, to David, the Longfella Hunt. We're going to leave Josh now and go over to England to the home of a very good friend of mine, David Hunt and Sons of Great Hanningbury in Essex. We'll visit Davy's home and we'll visit the lofts he races his pigeons to in Dagenham, the place he works. Davy's accomplishments in pigeons in just three seasons are astonishing to say the least. And I'm sure you'll all be interested in what Davy has to say. So join me now with Davy at his home and lofts. So this is a part of my business here. This is a, uh, what you call wolf actually in the docks of Dagenham. This is where my lofts are and this is where I actually raise pigeons at the moment. Along with my young son Davy, who just turned 16, and he's now working with me, just spending now more time with the pigeons. He's a great athlete, fantastic footballer, a child trials for West Ham, different clubs in London. He's also a London champion boxer. And he also inherited the great passion and love of the pigeons, which you'll see later on in the video. He's got a great rapport. And I've often said that the young age he is, even now, he would hold his own in the pigeon sport with the best of them. I first got into pigeons as a very small lad, at the age of about seven, through my next door neighbour, Bert Tinley, who raced in the Custom House Club living next door to me. I would peer through the fence and get a glimpse of them, get a glimpse of the pigeons whenever I could. I was fascinated from that very young age. My parents went on that year, God rest their souls, to build me a loft, which was made out of household doors. And that was when I very first started to race at probably the age of eight. Um, through work commitments and in building my business, I've drifted in and out of the sport. I've moved from my previous address as a young boy to an house in, around the corner where I've raised pigeons for probably two years with not the greatest success. I then went on the move to Epping with great success, winning the London North Road Combine, breaking records and still holding many records today, which was well over a decade ago, which is in the North London Federation. I then moved to um, my present home and thought this was a great location to raise pigeons, only to find that I was a little of 150 yards outside of the combine radius. I then decided through my wife pointing me in that direction, really, of racing pigeons here, which is the op-ed, without a doubt, this is Dagnum, this is probably considered to be the op-ed of the London North Road Combine. My family of pigeons I bought in Belgium from a man named Jan Grundler and also a guy named Felix Powell. Along with five pairs of pigeons I brought from Ronnie Bigwood. Those pigeons are basically my foundation of my family, which are still winning today. That was probably 14 or 15 years ago. Dave, what are your views on keeping your pigeons healthy? Please explain to the camera the products you use, supplementation, medication or whatever. How do you go about your regime of health in your nox? I pair up my pigeons late to most fanciers. I'll probably pair up late in the part of January. So around about January, I'd start looking at the pigeons for health because Obviously, you want your pigeons at that particular time to be healthy to pass on to the offspring. 
I would then at that stage call in a vet and I'd for no reason, not because I look at my opinions, they don't look right, it just it would be a natural thing I would do at that particular time. I'd get in a vet, he would then look at the pigeons via a swabbing, droppings, etc. And then he would say to me they may have a touch of something or another. Then I would treat to that disease if if, if there was one. Do you use a, a British vet day or is your vet vet from Belgium? My vet is a Belgian vet. Would you just like to explain briefly your feeding regime, your ideas behind feeding, as we know both know it's an arm. And also have you any points of view on the major cause of young bird losses in the UK? I have got my views. As you'll see my loft is situated on a jetty. So I had to make a loft from limited space and I had to put all the ingredients into that loft on the width of the jetty. I couldn't you can't walk either side of my loft. You've got to control everything from inside on the downstairs floor and upstairs I've built a balcony. But I put an aviary on my young bird loft to I believe young birds, especially on the dark, have got to get as much natural sunlight as they possibly can so there's not a better way rather than leaving them all over the roofs etc is to leave them in an aviary i only breed a small amount of pigeons from top quality you know i a chosen pair which have produced previous and i can more or less guarantee these pigeons so i haven't got loads of space i haven't got loads of time and i'll breed about 30 to 35 young ones and most seasons I'll end up with 20 to 25. Um, so that loss of young birds doesn't really affect me, but I know it's a problem throughout the country. Uh, I believe that the loss of young birds is through internal illness. I believe that the internal illness at this precise moment, and has probably been around for five years, is paratyphus. I believe it attacks the nervous system, the brain, the ability of the pigeon in army, it attacks a lot of the pigeon, but from the eye looking out, you can't detect this. They look perfectly well, and you may see them staring in the space on the odd occasions or just twitch as though they're looking at something. But paratyphus, I believe, is the reason for the loss of pigeons. Do you take precautions against paratyphus? I do you use a new injection vaccine from Belgium, uh, preempted by... A 10 day courses of antibiotics with your pigeons today, day? Yes. I will treat my old birds, as I said, in January through the vet before pairing up. And then maybe three months before racing, I will treat for paratyphus along with paramixo for young bird racing. Um, I believe this. I, I, I never I let my pigeons build up immunity for many years. And last year, I never done it. I won 12 first federations in five entries in amalgamations. I was once first, four times second, plus several other positions. I'd also won the London North Road Combine twice. That in itself is a, a, a marvellous achievement. And I thought I was too clever in leaving my pigeons to build up immunity. And they never, they, they fell at the final hurdle. And I believe it's probably set me back a year or two because this is how severe the diseases are, cross-contamination in baskets, buying from one loft and putting into another, high immunity in one loft, low immunity in the other, crossing diseases. And at the end of the day, I believe it's that important that I would always treat now, always young birds. Again, parasites. Parasites. When... Or if you was going to introduce pigeons into your very successful family pigeons, Dave, would there be anything in particular you would look for when choosing the pigeon? Would it just be solely on performance? Would it be the fancier himself that you study? Uh, do you take into consideration his loft position, for example? Do you take into consideration how many birds he sends? Uh, bloodlines of these pigeons, would they go well with your own type of pigeon? Could you explain, please, the kind of pigeon you would go after to introduce into your family? Well, you, that is um, a, a variety of a question. Yes, I would look at the lot position. I would look at the amount of pigeons he sends. 
I would look at was he winning years ago. But mostly, the most important aspect is he winning today. I would want to look at winning pigeons today. That's the sort of pigeons I would want to introduce to my pigeons, which are winning today. This is the third season I've raced. Um, I've, prob I've, I've probably had here 60 races. I've won over 31st Federation. I've won three London North Road Combines. I've won amalgamations. I've won everything there is possibly to win in the three seasons I've been here. I've also took the first 10, 8, 6 in federations and in open races. And only, which you'll see, with racing 15 wood with Cox and racing about 25 young birds. So we have five cocks, four cocks, four cocks, a total of 13 cocks, with six or seven young cocks coming up to make our section 18, 20 pigeons. That's all we ever raced. The most Woodward cocks I've ever raced is 18. I think 18 are top quality, plenty of air space, plenty of loft space, well, with top quality is more than enough. You're a very wealthy man, Dave, and obviously I know that uh, you're a fearless person with pigeons, having spent thousands and thousands of pounds on pigeons over the years. And in the main, you've been very successful with your choices. Would you say that there are pigeons that are fantastic performance pigeons, but have got no ability to reproduce in the stock pen? Yes, without a shadow of a doubt. And I also know, Dave, that you have a theory that you studied, yes. which is the throw theory that you use very successfully in your selection yes. of the performance pigeon. Yes. Uh, obviously, it's very difficult to explain that without actually showing the viewer the pigeon and, and the thing. But how, on a percentage basis, how successful would you say the throat theory really is regarding selecting? I'll tell you how successful I think the throat theory is. I actually inherited this from a very, very good friend of mine, Mr. Roy Calder. He phoned me up one day and said, Dave, you're flying an outstanding pigeon. Would you mind if I come over and looked at your pigeons? I'd known this man as a young boy and he was once the greatest flyer, in my opinion, in London. So I, I was very delighted to speak to this man on the phone and I, I arranged for him to come and visit my pigeons. And I'd heard this man was a very good judge. And I said to him, I've got 40 stock pigeons. I only have a very small amount of pigeons, which you'll see at a later date. And he went down with my son, who was my boy, 16 at the time. He was about 10 at the time. And he took him to the stock loft. And I was in the middle of making some phone calls. And I was about to join him. And I said, get the best pigeons, which you feel and put them in one section. And he said, OK, Dave, I'll do this. And he preempted on coming to do this. We'd spoken on the phone and he said, I'll bring a, you know, a light with me. I'll bring me loft jacket and I'll come down and I'll look at your pigeons and I'll give you my honest opinion. And he'd done this. And to my amazement, in the 40 pigeons I had there, if I would have picked 20, he picked 18. he never seen the pigeons before and it was on his theory. Now, I was astonished. And then I was intrigued and then I got in deep conversation and he's a very abrupt and honest, straightforward man, probably the straightest man you'll ever meet. And uh, it was a fear he didn't want to educate me in and we become friends and, and he has educated me in that theory to a point and I've picked up points on that myself. But uh, I was absolutely amazed that he picked up six pigeons and put them in a basket. He said, deep. One particular head, which you'd be very familiar with, is Tia. And he said, in his entire history of racing pigeons, it's the best head he's ever seen. Now, that pigeon is the grand, great, great grandmother to every champion pigeon I've ever produced. It's got the blood of that pigeon in. Now, when he had said this, I had to now look and think, you know, and not only did he pick one pigeon, but he actually all marked them from 20 down to 18 
and I couldn't have picked him out differently myself, and that's a fact. That is on the throw theory. And I also would like for you to know, or if you could tell him for me, that he will kill pigeons unless, doesn't matter how they handle, mm. what their eyes are like, mm. feather, etc. If they haven't got the throw he's mm. looking for, mm. he discards them and kills them. Yeah. Could you just sort of come People judge pigeons for different varieties the eye, the shape, the balance, the wing. You know, I like to I like the pigeon to give you its wing. When we talk about muscle, muscle is great, but muscle tightens up and can work against you. Supple muscle is the great muscle to get. That's why, going off the subject, feeding is very important, how you feed your pigeons to feed the muscle, to feed the body, in my opinion. Roy would look at a pigeon and disregard all that. He would, he would like that if it had that plus the throw, but he would give all that away for the throw. So that's how much he regards the throw theory, you know, and at the end of the day, I would, I don't regard it that as I as that. I would like to see the throw with a bonus of the other additive qualities in a pigeon, but Roy would disregard it. I've seen him go to people's lofts and say, I would kill that pigeon. And the man said, you know, that's 10 times a winner. And he said, it wouldn't, how's a perch in my loft? And, and genuinely meant it. Are there any particular performances your pigeons have achieved for you that stand out above all others, or do you look at all wins in the same light? This is an important question. It's a great question because although I've had pigeons for 30 odd years, I've actually physically raised pigeons for no more than 10 or 12 years. So if you look at the performances I've done, they don't go over three decades, they go over one. And on the first training toss of the first year, I get excited when, I'm, when my pigeons go away for the first training toss, young or old. There's a great buzz. That's what keeps us all in the sport. And winning at any level is a great achievement. And I've had some great success. You know, I really have. Um, I've had 25 pigeons sending 25 arrive right together and win the Fed. You know, I've took 12 to an open race and took the first 12. On many occasions, you know, winning the Fed with numbers of pigeons. Uh, I, I, I had a great race in the London North Road Combine with a pigeon called Davy Boy. 15 entries, 15 arrivals, first London North Road Combine, various other positions in the first 10, which was a record at that time. But the greatest performance I can say comes to mind was the performance of Sunny Boy, which was a Stonehaven race of 10 hours and 14 minutes. It was an achievement of, um, I raised 13, 15 Woodward cocks, so I spend a lot of time and a lot of observation. I've got a great rapport with my pigeons, and I'll, there's a bond there. I'll get to know them, you know, I'll get to know what they're capable of doing, and I'll push them at that point. You know, when they show me signs and I know their capabilities, that's when I'll come in and I'll start pushing them. And this pigeon, he, he showed me, he's six times a Fed winner, and he showed me. Ten years previous, I'd won the combine with a pigeon called Maze Way after my mum got rest of soul. And this pigeon would fly around as a team and all of a sudden bang up above them three or four feet. And I've never seen this before, but this pigeon was doing it in exercise, building up to the combine, which we'd, we'd won. So ten years later, Sonny Boy was doing the same flying around and just banging up three, four foot above the others. And I was amazed. I thought, I've seen this done before. And he'd, on the four exercises that week, building up to the combine, he'd done it on three occasions. And he was, you know, he was telling me, you know, I'm going to take a hell of a lot of beat in here, you know. And I, I decided to, you know, have a, a little bet on him, which he'd do. He was my fancy pigeon. I only sent six, six entries and, and I had five in the first... 50 at a London Old Road Combine, which was a real hard day. But he was 10 hours and a, 10 hours 14, and, and Roy Calder, as we talk about, he, he comes, he's, he has difficulty breathing, and he's out of pigeons now, but he comes nine out of 10 races on, um, on a race day, you come and watch the pigeons arrive. And he's a great judge, you know, with his expertise over the years, he won't be far behind. If he had a pigeon to be four hours, you know, you, it'd be more often than not. People say three and three quarter hours, three and a quarter hours, but he's more or less on, you know, he's on schedule, you know. And he said, this is going to be an hard day today, Dave, you know. 
south south west wind he said you know your pigeons have got to be in top top quality and we've gone through the conversation in picking them up you know when i spoke to him in the car how i prepared them and how i fancy them etc and uh, as we was looking i said here he comes and he came right off the road like a train and stevie medlock was there along with derek scales and as the pigeon i ran up the stairs my boy had timed him in he'd actually they said he'd gone in like a ufo he'd gone over the loft and just gone in backwards and as I walked out and timed the pigeon in, now you've got to remember it's 10 and quarter, 10 hours, 14 minutes. And you're thinking you could be behind, you could be in front. It's an occasion, the phone doesn't ring. It's a, it's a long race, you know, sort of 380, 90 miles. Velocity was about 40 mile an hour. You could, you could wind up the pigeon's doing it a lot quicker. So at that particular time, you don't know. And as I timed him in, he looked as though he hadn't been round the corner. And... Um, I said to Roy, called up and said, what do you think? He said, you've won the combine. He said, don't even think anything different. He said, the way that pigeon come, he said, trust me, you've won the combine. And that gave me great belief. I thought, you know, he's not often wrong. And uh, that was probably the best occasion in racing pigeons I've ever had because I prepared him, sent a small team, and more or less, you know, I was more or less certain of him bringing great achievements home with it, which he did. What would you say, Dave, to those fanciers that believe that the only way to win is by the use of performance enhancing drugs? Um, what do you say to those fanciers? I, they believe that you've used drugs, they believe that I use drugs, the likes of Josh Fona, etc. You've got to remember that the quality of the pigeon run you can only build an house on foundations. And if your pigeons are of top quality, they wouldn't need drugs. And if your pigeons need drugs, it wouldn't enhance them to beat a pigeon without drugs of top quality. Drugs is, um, in society in general, is ruined the young kids today, etc., for the drug problems we've got on the streets. Any unprescribed drug is a problem. Full stop. I can't reiterate that drug, any kind of drugs in any shape or form would damage internally. You know, if you get an athlete and I still go and have a run, I'm 42. If I'd have abused myself, I wouldn't be able to sustain that in myself. And it's like a pigeon or in anything. You can't keep going to the well. One day it's gonna be dry. And if you're drugging your pigeons, it's only going to be for a short period finished. At the end of the day, there's no real reason why you would want to get a, a month of top performances from a pigeon when you can go and get three, four, maybe even five years and produce naturally offspring alike. You know, That's how you build a foundation of top, top quality pigeons through natural supplements. Do you use any form of natural supplementation? All my products are naturally supplemented. They're all natural products. But I would use them throughout the year to maintain the elf I've already got. You can only build on the elf if your pigeons are elf. Supplements of any kind are respond to elf. So you, it's very important. You must diagnose the problem early and treat it. If there isn't a problem, all well and good. If there is a problem, then the supplements you give will respond. Having seen both Josh Fonet's lofts and Davy Hunt's lofts, um, it's very difficult for you to gauge visually just how well those two lofts function. Obviously, the measure of that is the, the amount of performance and winning that both fans have accomplished. Um, I'm quite proud of Dave's loft because I actually built it. And Dave spent an awful lot of time in discussion with myself in its design. Both Josh's loft and Dave's loft function virtually exactly the same. There's no air at the bottom of the loft coming in at all. And the only air that enters the loft is at the front under the apex. The air just dissolves out through the tiles naturally. No ventilation at either end of the apex. The difference between the two lofts of course, is that Dave's loft is elevated and, and, and extremely exposed as opposed to Josh's that is a little bit lower to the ground. 
um, feet of volume of air above the boxes, and both lofts provide perfect environment for their inmates, a very, very important thing. We have over 35 First Open Federation winners, three First Open Combine winners, First Amalgamation winners, and top Federation honours week in, week out. Davy Hunt and Sons performances are phenomenal. He owns good pigeons, races them to a good loft, and has been well educated. In a short while, we're going to go and join the Crammer crew down on the English coast, south coast, and we're going to see how the race is progressing and exactly what has unfolded during the course of the event. We'll catch, hopefully, the early pigeons crossing the channel. And before we do, as I'm sure you won't want to miss this, if you'd like to press the pause button, go and grab yourself a cup of tea and some biscuits and then fasten your seat belts. We'll give you that short break. Well, then that was uh, interesting. And what I'd like to say, okay, is that is a metaphor for the Canning Town Boys version of the Essex Boys murders. Now, you have to read between the lines, okay, and um, they're using pigeons as a metaphor. Okay, so there we have it. We got the career of Davy Hunt, the long fella, in his own words, but you have to read between the lines. Okay. So this is Art Hostage, and it's going to be, right, episode, oh, let me just check. Oh, I need to check because this is not a live. This is going to be the recorded one, isn't it? But this is going to be Art Hostage, episode, 460 and it's called David the Longfellow Hunt, Davy Hunt in his own words. Art Hostage signing off.